Good evening and welcome. Please note that we have closed captioning for this evening's event. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you can see two letters, CC. You can click on that and you will get closed captioning. I will give you a moment to do that. And we've also put it in the chat. Again, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lisa Coleman and I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation and I use she and her pronouns. Let me begin by saying today we will have a Q, uh, Q and A and so you can put your questions in the Q and A feature which says Q and A at the bottom of your screen. Please note that we will be grouping questions in the interest of time. Uh, so you can begin to submit your questions all along the way as we go forward. And then those questions I will uh, be able to uh, weave together in the conversation uh, with, uh, with Minda Hartz. As always, I have to thank my amazing team in the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, some of whom are right now I'm thrilled to work with them every day. They're an amazing group of highly talented people who do such innovative things. So thank you to all of them, to my entire team. I literally, I say it all the time, it's a dream team. And I am uh, very, uh, very happy to be able to work with them. Let me also say that I hope everyone is taking very good care. People keep saying that this is a new normal. It is not. We have increased stress, health, care for at people at home, collegial difficulties, stress, uh, as I said, stress, pandemic, disparities, et cetera. Some of you know what I've been saying is we need a new different, one that recognizes the disparate impacts, the urgency instead of rhetoric as we move toward transformation that emphasizes equity in action. Before moving into the program, I would like to acknowledge also all of the frontline workers, all of the workers behind the scenes whose labor is often unseen and uncounted. Those who continue to sacrifice for our well being, health care, those who clean and maintain the hospitals, people who work in sanitation services, public transportation, etc. All of you, thank you. Thank you for what you've done to care for us to help us care for ourselves, we know that we could not be without you. We hope that everyone is taking very good care during this COVID-19 pandemic and please visit the NYU information site for additional information and resources. As we all know, a lot has already happened this year and we're just beginning 2021. As we began 2021 in the midst of, as I've already mentioned, health and social crises and transformation, COVID-19 drastically impacting and reconfiguring our lives and connections with disproportionate impact on marginalized communities, particularly BIPOC community members. We entered this year and quickly faced escalated disruption, racist inter insurrection, ongoing national and global dissension, we must continue to focus our attention and hold ourselves and others accountable to address all of the aforementioned and to move beyond, as I said earlier, rhetoric to action. It is important that each of us across our entire NYU global community recognize this urgency and scope of impact to continue to prioritize our individual family and collective health and well being, and also to build inclusive communities built in action, transparency, and ongoing learning. Our partners across NYU and OGI can, will continue to offer programming and resources to aid in that process, some of which will be shared as we go through the evening and certainly in the chat. Now I would like to take a moment to honor those who've come before us, our ancestors, those who've paved the way some lives, lives who've been lost, some of those known to us and those unknown. And of course, the indigenous peoples upon whose lands we sit and occupy. Let us take 10 seconds of silence and reflection and recognition.
Thank you. Thank you again for joining us today for our first NYU Be Together Global Innovators, Global Scholars and Innovators series conversation for the spring 21, 21 semester. This series, along with the rest of NYU Be Together initiatives are centered on innovating, acting and transforming as a community together. We hope that you will follow us in the Office of Global Inclusion for more updates, especially this spring. We have a lot of activities, resources and information and programs available across all of OGI, including CMAP and of course the LGBTQ Plus Center, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Thank you to our partners. Uh, across NYU, particularly the Women of Color Network and the Women's Leadership Forum, the Office of the Provost, and all of our partners within the NYU Be Together and NYU Women 100 initiatives. And thank you to all of the people serving on the committees. Again, we could not do this without you. The Women of Color Leadership Network was established to create, uh, build and build community and provide mentoring, networking and professional development opportunities for women across NYU. This space is meant to be uh, expansive and help people grow their network circles, provide a way to connect with other women of color across the university. And special thanks to Jennifer Curry in, in public safety, Tamara Santiago in IT, and April Thompson in enrollment management. And of course, Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver in OGI for spearheading this initiative. Thank you. The Women's Leadership Forum is a presidential and provostial initiative which fosters leadership development and facilitates uh, professional growth and sponsors outreach for women uh, and it's currently who are currently in leadership roles across NYU and those who aspire to be in uh, leadership roles. Very special thanks to G Gigi, Depo D excuse me, the Pico and Associate uh, Vice Provost Karen Narcissian for their leadership and co-chairs of the WLF and thank you for your ongoing partnership. Today's program is open to the entire NYU community, and we are delighted to share it across our global network. So as we prepare for the conversation, I'd like us to consider the following. There are vast discrepancies between, uh, and as we know, disparities when we think about BIPOC communities, and particularly when we think about gender. Single women of color and con contrasted to single white women, the median net worth of single white women ages 36 to 49 is $42,600. These statistics are taken from 2007, 2018, excuse me, and 61% of the median wealth for the same age for white men. For single women of color in the same age group, they have a median wealth of just five to $100, as contrasted, as I just said, to the 42,600. Black and Latinx women are, and indigenous women are also drastically more worse off in each age bracket, with almost half of single women between the ages of 18 and 64 reporting zero or negative wealth, compared with 23% of single white women according to that report. Latinx women will have to wait until 2248, and Black women would have to wait until 2124 for equal pay. For Indigenous women, we're looking more at 2168. And the gap widens as Black, Latinx, and Indigenous women get older. Persistent pay inequality can have far reaching economic consequences. And we see this in terms of the impact of other communities as well, communities with disability, Asian and Pacific Islander communities, and the ways in which these disparities also impact those communities differentially in terms of the intersections. According to a recent regression analysis of federal data by the uh, IWPR, equal pay would cut poverty among working women and their families by more than half and add 513 billion to the national economy. And we know that equal pay and women in the workplace contributes to a country's overall and GD GDP. The pandemic has exacerbated ex existing gender disparities and has disproportionately impacted women of color. For example, according to the December federal jobs report, approximately 159,000 women lost their jobs. And while men gained 19,000 jobs net, there is much work to be done. 
As our special guest, Minda Hartz, has demonstrated, much like Kamala Harris and Stacey Abrams, to name a few, women of color are leaders in strategizing the solutions to realize gender equity. It is now my great pleasure and honor to welcome Minda Hartz for our first 2021 NYU Be Together Scholars and Innovators series. And I'm just gonna say a little bit about her before we get started. First of all, let me say it's just a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to be in conversation with one of our NYU faculty. Minda Hartz is the CEO of the Memo LLC and an award-winning best-selling author of the Memo, What Women of Color Need to Know to Secure a Seat at the Table. In case you can't see it, it's right here. You need to go out and buy the book. Buy the book. I just knocked down my NYU sign. Buy the book. So. In 2020, Minda was, uh, Minda was named the t- number one top voice for equity in the workplace by LinkedIn. She is a professor at NYU Wagner and hosts a live weekly podcast called The Secure. She is an Aspen Ideas Fellow Scholar and has been featured on MSNBC's Morning Joe, Fast Company, The New York Times, Time Magazine. Minda frequently speaks at companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Nike, Bloomberg on topics such as managing diverse teams, courageous leadership, and advancing women of color in the pipeline and in the workplace. Thank you for joining us, Minda. I am delighted. Thank All right, you. so <laughs> <laughs> we're going to kick it off. Let's do it. All right, so. First of all, let me just say, you know, fantastic book, fantastic. Congratulations on all your success. So I love the story of how you came to name your company and your book, The Memo LLC. Can you talk to us a little bit about The Memo? And for those very few out there who I I hope very few who haven't read the book yet or seen one of your interviews, uh, can you just talk a little bit about how that title emerged and that journey? Yeah, absolutely. And so... I know we're going to get into it, so I try not to get ahead of myself, but <laughs> what I will say is um, I was trying to figure out, I, you know, just like you're trying to name anything, you're trying to see what resonates. And for me, I was actually going through a really tough time in my career and my former life, and I was taking a, a Amtrak train from uh, D.C. to New York City, and I was listening to a, a Drake song, um, a rapper, and the song is Trophies, and it says, did y'all boys not get the memo? And I thought, oh my gosh, yes, uh, corporate America, many institutions had not gotten the memo <laughs> that <laughs> that we are here, that we're that we're you know ready. We have these degrees, we have the certifications, we have the the bandwidth to have a seat at the table, and not only have a seat at the table, but lead. And so um, that was really the impetus of what made me think about later writing a book and and doing the advocacy work. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm gonna piggyback on that question. Can you tell us specifically about the journey to getting it published and readership response? The workplace uh, silence around Trayvon Martin's death and the difficulty of getting published? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. <clears throat> so it was, I was actually living in California at the time and I was uh, working, but bef- this was before starting the memo. and. It was 2012 and I was working on Wilshire Boulevard and right outside of my office window was the, a march was taking place. And I remember just thinking, yes, Black Lives Matter outside, but they also have to matter inside, inside the workplace. And as the only one, only woman of color, only Black woman um, at my company at the time or in a professional role, I felt that isolation. I felt like Um, nobody was talking about these issues inside the workplace, not like we're talking about them today. It was almost like people, um, you know, they were taking their Starbucks and walking right past it as if nothing was happening and no one saying anything. And, and I felt that pain, you know, many of us have to still go to work and perform at a high level and still grapple with the trauma that we're experiencing as people of color in this country. And it really got me thinking, Dr. Coleman, and I started to interrogate my place in this world and my place in the workplace and what I was going to do to make the workplace better than I found it. Because I realized that the inequalities that were happening on the street were also happening inside the workplace. And in 2012, I didn't know what that looked like, but I started to really come to terms with the inequalities because I knew that we were talking about women in the workplace. But what I also knew is that they weren't talking about me. Uh, Oftentimes that when you say women in the workplace, you're talking about white women first and everybody else after. 
And I just didn't, that didn't set right with me. I'm like, you know, not all women experience the workplace the same. And so it wasn't until 2013, and this is really pivotal in, in my career story. In 2013, I took a new job and I was to, for, for the seat at the table and all the things and uh, being the only one, I knew what that felt like. So going into this new environment, I expected it feel the same, right? Isolation, microaggressions, you know, the things that, that we that we deal with in the workplace. And I didn't think it would be anything different, but it, it was very different because I had moved from a subtly racist environment to a more blatant environment. And it started to affect my mental health. And as I was in that situation, um, and I know we'll talk about it too, but all of my colleagues, uh, did not have enough courage to be able to stand up for me. And at times I didn't think I could stand up for myself. Uh, I felt like I had lost my agency and a very long story short, if you don't have the memo, I do talk about it in there, but I remember things had gotten so bad inside the workplace and I went into my boss's boss's office and we had this conversation and she said, you know, I know you're having these issues here in the workplace. And I said, well, actually somebody else has an issue with me. I'm just trying to do my job. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, Let's uh, identify where the issues really yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like the work that I'm doing. And um, and she said, yeah, well, you're doing a great job. It's unfortunate that this situation has happened. We we hired you because we thought you had tough skin. And I, Dr. Coleman, I remember being in that office and I was so fragile at that time. <laughs> I just was like really hurt from workplace racially ab abuse. And I was telling myself, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry in that office because this is another woman, right? Telling me that I know that you're being, you know, racially aggressed by another woman, but she's been here a long time and she had more empathy for that person causing harm than me. And I remember leaving that office and, and this really drives home my point, but I left that office and it was on a Friday and I walked to my car as quickly as I could. And I get in the car, Dr. Coleman, and I I just bust out into tears because I started to think about my grandmother cried the same tears. My mother cried the same tears, you know, being a black woman in the workplace. And now I'm crying those same tears and our ancestors cried those same tears. And I, I just as a first generation college student, first person in my family to go into a corporate role, I was just devastated that there was, I've worked hard. I've done everything that they've said I should do, but I can't stop this racism. I can't stop it by myself, right? I need courageous leaders to also dismantle this system. And it was in that car in 2013, and I turn on the radio and Whitney Houston's Where Do Broken Hearts Go comes on the radio. And I thought, I'm, now I'm laughing and crying at the same time, like hysterically. And I'm like, oh God, you have such a sense of humor. Um, where do the broken hearts go of women of color when we can't take it anymore? And it was in that car that I decided that I'm gonna take my triumph and turn it into um, something else, right? Uh, uh, my, my tragedy into a triumph. And I decided that I needed to do something that centered on the experiences of women of color so that we don't leave the workplace, but we normalize those bad characters leaving and us being able to have equity in the workplace. And, and it was really the impetus for the memo, starting the company in 2015, and then eventually the book. And um, even to your point with the publishers, there at the time were five major publishers. Um, four of them said there's no um, audience for the memo, that these things aren't happening inside the workplace. And when you don't have diversity, you don't have inclusion, you don't have equity around those tables. Um, two things can be true at the same time. You might experience a workplace that you never experienced racism, and I might, right? It doesn't, but you can't discount that many women of color and people on the margins experience that. And so I'm so happy that my publisher, Seal Press Hachette, they said, you know, I guess we don't have any books like that. Um, and now it opened up a whole new genre and became a best-selling book. And now I'm writing two new books next. That's wonderful. And thank you for sharing your story with us. I think it's so important because there's so many pressures in the workplace and you're right. So many tears that are shed and often in isolation. And we know what that can create. So thank you for sharing. And thank you for sharing also the journey to move from tragedy to triumph. Um, so one of the sections of the text speaks about the education of Black women and the ways in which even though we're the most educated. And I have a joke, which is, you know, I talk to my, you know, five best friends and literally they're like 700 degrees between us, right? I mean, that, that's, a, but like literally like something like 30 degrees between us, right? And, um, and one of the things that we're often told is, right, go get an education that will help 
trans, a transform, right? What's going to happen next? But what, as you just talked about, we're still overlooked, underpaid, thought of as, as difficult, not promoted. So given this, myth, which, uh, which underscores, right, is underscored by this myth of meritocracy, right? So given this myth of meritocracy, uh, where one is often told about these educational possibilities and access, tell us a little bit more about why that's not true at all. When we think about black women, we think about the representations of CEOs or presidents of elite colleges, and we know it's abysmal, right? So talk to us a little bit more about this myth of meritocracy and the implications as it pertains to, right, certainly women of color and their mobility um, to things across organizations and certainly across the academy. Yeah, I, I actually think about this in terms of a meritocracy. I, you know, James Baldwin, he always talked about the lie, believe in the lie. <laughs> and I think right. that's right. You do know Baldwin's one of my favorite authors. We'll end with a quote with Baldwin, as we yeah. always do. <laughs> and and that is I, I believe that is the lie that um that has been told to us. If you get an education, if you work really hard, then sky's the limit, right? And and I believed that I entered into the workplace thinking if I work really hard, you know, come in early, stay late, do all the things that I'm supposed to. I did, I got the degree, you know, the Cosby show showed me that, you know, like <laughs> I, I, I did, did that part. And, um, but then I realized that something else was actually happening that my colleagues who were coming in late, who, you know, weren't doing as half as good of a job as me, they were advancing. And I started to really look and I, I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? I'm doing all the things that, I, that I'm told get you ahead. And what I found is that the rules, there are um, rules that we don't get the guidebook to, the handbook to. And oftentimes uh, the people who get ahead isn't those who work the hardest, but those who have the right relationships. Uh, and if you are the only one, sometimes we don't have the benefit of somebody in the dominant majority um, saying, oh, you remind me of your daughter. They don't see their daughter in us. Oh, you remind me of your son. You, we don't get that. We don't have that privilege. And so oftentimes the people that get advanced are those who remind them of themselves or have similar interests. And so sometimes we are overlooked in those ways, even if we are the most qualified for the job. And I think that's in the book I talk about, you know, office politics. I think that, and if you don't know how to navigate those office politics, it can be, really be detrimental to your career, and it's unfortunate because, um, you know, I think the workplace should be. Um, we need to figure out how to get back to a meritocracy in some ways because I, I do think that it. Um, a lot of Black women, women of color, people of color are overlooked because we don't have the same social capital that some of our colleagues do, and that's why I felt it was really important to talk about those things so that our allies or our sponsors can also take that into consideration when they're thinking about who to advance, who they, who they like, you know, those, those sorts of things, all those biases that tend to creep in. I think that's so important what you're talking about. And we know from research, right, that we quote unquote gravitate toward people who remind us of ourselves, which means exactly as you said, we're going to promote, retain, et cetera. And I also like what you said about this, uh, it's important to emphasize what you said about social capital and how social capital gets is related to mobility, right? And you say this in the book, right? The, the the networks that we create where we go to school, right? All of those things matter. And we know if we think about the long tail of the legacy of, of marginalization, sometimes we're just not able to even be at that table in terms of, of representation. So thank you so much again for that, for that comprehensive answer. So uh, you talk a lot about the need for representation in the book, the need for women of, uh, well, you also talk about it in some of your lectures, but you know, cause I've been you know, watching you nonstop, but uh, let's let, I'm just using the textual reference. So you discuss the need for representation and the need for women of color uh, and their strengths to be centered. And so one of the things that you talk about is the uh, Shirley, you talk about uh, the, the table metaphor. And then you uh, go and talk about Shirley Chisholm. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair, which of course I love. Um, so if you could just talk to us a little bit more about that, because I think in the book, what you really do a good job of, of, of letting us know is exactly how, right, that, that when we think about that table and what, um, what may 
right, keep us keep us from that table. And then even when we get to the table, might kick us off the table. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, you, you know, it's interesting because I think a lot of people talk about a seat at the table, but for me, it's really about agency. It's about ownership. It's about legacy. Because if we're not in the room, uh, then we're not a part of the decisions that would potentially benefit future generations of women of color. So it's not enough and. Um, our former first lady, Michelle Obama, often says it's not enough just to sit at the table, but sometimes we've been too scared to shake it up, right? And so I think that we, <laughs> we, have, to, we have to, first of all, get in the room, right, and, and have a voice, um, tap into our agency. We're there for a reason. But I think oftentimes, even before we get to the table, we often question why someone has invited us do we belong here? And I think that's, it starts number one in our mind. And I talk about um, having an empire state of mind versus an enemy state of mind. Like, first of all, we have to know that we've worked really hard to get here. This isn't charity, <laughs> regardless of what <laughs> anybody else thinks, you know, like you, you deserve that. And I, anytime I get a chance, Dr. Coleman, I tell women of color, I say, you belong in every room that you enter, but not every room deserves to have you and understanding the difference. Because sometimes we will work so hard, we will give the best years of our career to rooms that will never see us, right? Will never hear us. And it's also up to us to understand our career. Why? Why do we want to be in that room? Is it because somebody told us we should have that seat at the table? Or is that because something that we really want? And I think after we get really clear on what our career needs are, then we can decide how we want to shake the table, how we want to shake the room, right? And so this isn't just for us to get in there and kick our feet up. It's about bringing others that look like us with us too, so that even in the succession planning, if we know that we're leaving a room, what are we doing to make sure that another Black woman, another woman of color, another person um, who has been isolated has an opportunity? And so there's so much capital that we have once we occupy the room, but we first need to be in it. And if we're not in the room, at least making those relationships, building connections with people who will speak our names that are in those rooms, because a lot, there's a lot of power in those rooms. And um, I want us to make sure that we're part of the decision making as well. Thanks again. I mean, opening those pathways, as we know, is so key. And I think that one of the things that I did, I love this, this empire state of mind, because so many of us, and you actually also talk about sort of imposter, right? This idea of being an imposter. And I always say this, right? How we frame something is what we get. If we frame something as a problem, including ourselves, then right, that's the mindset that we walk in. And I say this all the time. And when I look at myself in the mirror in the morning, I don't see a problem. I see possibility and solutions, just like when I look at you and when I look at other people like us. So, so I think that that is important to underscore and really, right, and it, it allows you to occupy that seat at the table in different ways to make way, to have that courage to make way. So thank you, because I think without that courage, right, you can just sit in those rooms and, and, and again, ask yourself, why are you there? Which doesn't provide the opportunity for you to create space for others. No, I, I love that so much, Dr. Coleman, because oftentimes we talk ourselves out of the situation. Um, you know, <laughs> it's like certain things might, uh, are they true or not, or are they not true? You know, sometimes we've created this narrative in our head that may or may not be true. And sometimes we <laughs> have to get out of our own way and um, you're there for a reason. What you do in that seat counts next. And so, you know, don't question it, but uh, use it to your advantage and, and use it to benefit others. And, and the last thing is, um, you know, don't be afraid of the seat. I, I, I remember when I did occupy, <laughs> get to my seat, I, I, you know, I didn't say anything. I, I was taking up space because I didn't, I was just grateful to be there, but uh, I realized that being grateful was not on the job description. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, I like what you said too, right? Uh, they need to be grateful that you're there, right? Yeah. That's, the, that's the gratitude in a different direction. I think yes. that's, uh, that's really true. And um, so thank you very much for that. And I also, I, well, we'll come back. Okay, so uh, the ugly truth. So this, uh, you speak to the confusion that you felt. Yeah. After reading Sheryl Sandberg's 2013 text, Lean In, I really appreciated how you described, and this is quote, wanting to shake the book in the hope that some advice would fall out to address the differences faced by women of color in the workplace, end quote. You said, then say, quote, if I leaned in anymore, my face would be on the damn table, end quote. I'll just let you talk a little bit more about 
your experience, why this resonated, and what this has to do with thinking about like Kim Crenshaw intersectionality and all of that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that that is intersectionality. It's it's one of those things that I don't think some of our counterparts understand that they can go and pick up a thousand books that uh, resonate with their experience, <laughs> their lived experience, that read authors that have similar experience that look like them. As women of color, we don't always have that option to be able to pick up a career book and read about our experiences. And I remember being in the workplace when Lean In came out and everybody was talking about it and so excited. And I was excited too, because I'm like, oh, it's the women's manifesto. Right? <laughs> it's, it's finally something that's going to talk to me about what I'm experiencing, because I wasn't sure how to articulate what I was experiencing back then. And I read it and I just couldn't understand I understood that there was good information inside of the book that um, that I could, like many of us, we make it work for, for our situation, even though they're not really talking about us. But it's even that intersectionality, even the lens to say, hey, actually, this isn't probably an experience of every woman. And this is more probably um, a certain um, demographic of white women, even. I mean, that's not even working class white women uh, lean in. And so for me, I just was so frustrated, not at Sheryl Sandberg, but just at so many career books that just don't even include us that were asterisks, right, or afterthoughts, and won't, don't even consider. And I think that that's important uh, note to, to say is that even as women, um, there's hierarchies of oppression, right? Some women have are closer to uh, to proximity of power than others. And so even in that, we have to, as women, understand that, yes, white women do have um, more privileges. Uh, even one in five white women get advanced to the C-suite, whereas one in 25 women of color. So when we say women, career books for women, what women are we talking about? And so it was really, so for me, it was thinking about Toni Morrison when she said, write the book you want to read. And that's exactly what I decided to do. I love rap lyrics. I love business acumen. <laughs> and I wanted to talk about um, the, the experiences. And obviously I couldn't capture all the experiences of women of color, but I know some of the themes that we experience resonate um, across the board. But uh, so for me, it was like, okay, I guess I'm gonna have to write this book. And, and I have to tell you this, Dr. Coleman, when I was on a physical book tour, I had um, an older woman, black woman, uh, wait till the end of the book tour. And she came to me and she said, I'm sorry. And I said, why? And she said, I should have wrote this book for you. And I said, well, now this book is for us, you know, and um, and, and that's the, the courage part. Like, you just never know. I, I thought I wasn't that person. I thought I didn't have anything to add to this conversation because I didn't have, you know, tons of years of experience in corporate America. But um, once we use our voice, then it helps activate other voices. And so you always we all have a voice. We just have to decide how we want to use it. Thank you so much, Min. And I think it's so important how you're describing. There are just different ways to lean in and different spaces that we have to lean in. And the idea that, yes, yeah, some people are leaning in and how leaning in gets read through different cultural, social, sociocultural lenses. And I like it particularly how you said, even for, right, if we think about class across women, even white women, we can see the differences in terms of what happens when you lean in and don't and how you're perceived as aggressive or uh, assertive or those various things. So thank you very much for that. So uh, as it turns out, today is February 11th. And on February 11th, 1965, Malcolm X delivered a speech at the London School of Economics on racist violence. He opens his speech with a critique of the intersexual exclusions performed with through and within the quote unquote brothers, brotherhoods. And he talks a little bit more about how, right, there needs to be this sort of intersectional approach. Your chapter, No More Passes, is written for women readers who identify as white. So this is building on some of the things you just said. And you critique this model, this elite model of white feminism, of leadership, womanhood, sisterhood, that often sometimes seems to piggyback on the back of women and black women and other women of color. So can you talk to us a little bit about how, what you talk about in the book for those of who haven't read it and, um, and then specifically the kinds of things that you are suggesting that we need to move toward? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I think harms us in the workplace and even outside the workplace is thinking that everybody's experience is the same. And I think amongst, I I've, have friends, I have <laughs> spoke to a lot of white women and oftentimes, you know, one size fits all approaches seem to work, work best for, 
for many. And I, I don't think that many have considered that their experience is not the same as um, all women. And the fact that if they looked at the, the data, they would see that, right? And so for me, I think I just got so frustrated with uh, the fact that even in my career, I had mostly white men who helped advance my career. Um, and it was very, it was rare that um, any white women were ever demonstrating allyship to me <laughs> in that way, right? And so um, when I re wrote the memo and in interviewing hundreds of women of color, 99% said that it was white men that helped them get to the table. And so many white women were are always shocked to hear that, right? <laughs> but um, but what, I, what I find is that when we are in these systems of oppression in the workplace, typically, historically, there's only been a seat for one woman, right? And so sometimes that often, that scarcity mindset- the Scarcity makes model. <laughs> One only. <laughs> only one. <laughs> only one. Um, but we have to remind ourselves that that model doesn't work for everybody. So we there. Let me put it this way. When I was younger, my we used to go to my grandmother's house and she she would always invite everybody over for Sunday dinner. And I would always be so confused. I'm like, why is granny always inviting everybody over? And she has this really small table. And then she would um, pull the table out and it would magically expand and you plop <laughs> you plop like a plank and now it's a big table and we all can sit. And I think that that's what a lot of women don't realize is just because there's only been a small table, we can expand the table and white women, you, you got to bring that leaf. <laughs> <laughs> you got to bring it. You can lift as you climb, right? That, that we don't have to be in competition. We can be in collaboration. And if we were helping each other in these positions of power, we would see a difference. I mean, right now, um, uh, I think last year, McKinsey and Lean In did a study and they asked over 7,000 white women, how many of you view, see your, view yourselves as being an ally to women of color in the workplace? And over 80% said that they saw themselves as an ally to women of color in the workplace. They asked the same set of women of color, how many of you see white women as allies to you in the workplace? 20%. So it's a, it's, <laughs> it's a stark difference between us calling ourselves and seeing ourselves as a, a, a resource, as an advocate, as an ally, and actually demonstrating. So we have to ask ourselves, when is the last time we've demonstrated that we're helping women of color, that we're thinking of them, <laughs> that we're considering their experiences? And so I really wanted to be clear on that because, again, we talk about women heroes and women advocates, and typically some of those even, those advocates, those um, matriarchs uh, in white culture have been detrimental to black women have been <laughs> harmful to black women. And so again, we have to talk about intersectionality and we can't use uh, one size fits all approaches. And we need to know our history so that um, we can close the empathy gap between white women and women of color, because I don't think we have strong relationships in order to really help each other uh, past the surface, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I mean, I think you're exactly getting into the meat of it, right? That if we're going to do intersectionality, we actually have to engage and practice and learn from one another. And that's part of that learning cycle that I even mentioned at the beginning. And I also, I, you know, I'm reminded as you're talking, if we think about patterns, things like residential segregation, et cetera, we're not often in community with one another except for in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so to build those communities, you have to be intentional. You have to think about how are you building right, your knowledge base around like, how are you going to connect? How are you going to build pathways and all of those kinds of things to be what you call a success partner? So thank you again for that answer. Um, the other thing that you highlight is a, the distinction between a mentor and a sponsor. And the reason this question, now lots of people know the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. But one of the things, and I'll say this again, your text is laden with quotes from black women and leaders in art and science and politics and government. You can, I mean, it's just amazing how many different people you quote. Um, so could you speak about this as you talk about mentors, uh, both your literal uh, and uh, the aspiration like Beyonce, I know you, you, got, you got a lot of Beyonce and provide us some specific examples from your own life. Uh, you've talked a little bit about white male mentorship but can you talk about that sponsorship piece too? Absolutely. Um, it was really important for me to add a chapter, excuse me, <clears throat> um, say my name, say my name, <laughs> my throat, excuse me. I can give you a moment. We all need a moment sometimes. <laughs> 
Okay, I think I'm I think I'm good. Um, say my name, say my name was important because to my point that a lot of the business books and career books out there don't talk about black women leaders, don't talk about women of colored leaders. And for some of us who never get to read about our leaders or see our leaders on the cover of magazines or on the top, whatever list, we might not know they exist. And so I wanted to make sure that I um, said, excuse me, <clears throat> said their name at least. Um, and that was one of the fun thing for me, for people to email me and say, wow, I didn't even know that so-and-so worked here. And it opened up a, lar a larger dialogue. But when I was in my former life, I talked about having, um, realizing that I needed to also build relationships and build an internal network. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry about it. I've actually, there. I've occasionally had a little cold sometimes, not like a, you know, and so I totally understand. Yeah, it's like a little tickle in the back of my throat. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, when I was building my relationships inside the workplace, I started to think about from those people in different departments who I could partner with, um, you know, from executive assistants and, and so forth, just so that I was articulating my value and quantifying my worth across departments. And one of the gentlemen that I met, um, he was one of the most senior men in the department. And I was, if I'd still probably be waiting in my cube if I was wait, waiting on him to come talk to me. <laughs> so I had to, <laughs> had to start um, building a relationship with him. And when I'd see him, then it start, would be small talk and then it, continuously building on that. And then eventually I asked him for 15 minutes and you could do this virtually now back then I could do that in the office. Um, and he said, yes, because we had started to establish some type of relationship and I started to talk about my work. So when I'd see him, I, and he'd say, Hey, Minda, how's it going? I wouldn't just say, Oh, great Chuck and keep it moving. I would say, Oh, I'm working on this really amazing thing because I had to be my best advocate. And that's what I wanted you all to know is make sure that you're your best advocate because sometimes you can't depend on somebody else. You have to let them know what, what you're doing. And so I built that relationship with him, Dr. Coleman, but I didn't know where it would go. I didn't know if at some point he would become a success partner or a sponsor. But one day he was in a meeting, a very um, one of the senior staff meetings, and they were having this conversation and the CEO, she, she had gotten sick so she couldn't travel to this really big client meeting and so she asked her executive staff who were all white men and women um, who could go to San Francisco to take this meeting and nobody could go because they all had business travel and so um, my sponsor um, I didn't know that he was that at the time but he said you know what Minda's actually inside of she's in San Francisco right now why don't we let her take that meeting and everybody in the room was like no we don't know her she's junior you know <laughs> she's not ready maybe next year you know, this Minda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly you mean that black girl that little black girl? <laughs> you know the, those things that people say and um and he said yeah i i believe that she can do it um and you know i'm putting myself on the line if it doesn't work out then it'll be on me and i wasn't just doing my job dr coleman i got the call in um, San Francisco and Chuck calls me and he's like, it's your turn. Like, here's what's happening. I hope, you know, don't, don't make me don't regret mess this. Up. <laughs> <laughs> don't make me regret <laughs> And um, Be on time. <laughs> yeah, 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 you gotta stay ready. And, um, and it was that moment, I was so nervous. I didn't have, you know, I just had to be ready. And I, I like Hamilton, I didn't throw away my shot. I did what needed to be done and from that moment forward, a few months later, I was promoted and I had a seat at that table. I be because he changed my whole career in that moment. Mm -hmm. And you know, oftentimes people think that they have to give something up to help someone. His career was still intact. He actually probably had more feathers in his cap because now he found this superstar that nobody wanted to to take a shot on, right? And um, it was him speaking my name in the room that ch that changed my career trajectory. And I'm forever grateful and. If you, we all have an opportunity to speak someone's name in the room, we all have the opportunity, we all have a sphere of influence. You don't have to be the most senior person to create a space for somebody else. And, and I'm just so thankful that he did that because then once I entered the room, I was able to create space for other people. And I think that that's what we have to talk more about is that success partner. It's, it's one thing to, to say that you're invested in someone's success, but it's another thing to show it 
as you said, equity in action. And, and I think that that's what we all have to do. Oftentimes people think that it's the grand gesture, you know, climbing up to the Empire State Building with a Black Lives Matter sign, but it's actually the, the everyday actions. It's the everyday actions, right? Speaking people's name in the room, considering somebody else and or speaking up when someone's been you know, racially aggressed in a, in a meeting, like though it's the everyday actions that create the equity. Thank you so much. That's, I mean, I, you said it so well, and I appreciate you talking about being your own advocate and building those relationships. And of course, and then thinking about how you're going to be tapped as one of those high potential people. And I think the key thing that you said, of course, was you were ready. You were prepared, I was ready. <laughs> right? You were ready to be tapped. You just yeah. wait for that tap. So, and I think that's key for some of our students and our audience members out there, right? You have to be prepared when that opportunity comes along. Um, and for most of some, often we're, we are prepared, but then we have to go out there and sometimes create our own, right? Our own opportunities in terms of that advocacy. Um, now, this is a question that I, I actually, so you speak about networking and playing the game, when to play the game and when to get out, et cetera. Now I'm gonna confess for all those out there who think I'm an extrovert, I'm an introvert total introvert. The idea of getting on a boat with 10 of my non-closest friends for a day outing does not sound like a good time to me. <laughs> In fact, I can remember, Mind, I'll tell you this is a little story. I was, I was uh, not that much younger than I am now, to be honest to goodness truth. I went to an event. I was having a little social anxiety and I went to the closet at the time and called my then partner. Again, note to self, not a good, not a good choice at the moment. But anyway, I was like, should I come out of the closet? Like, <laughs> so uh, this idea of how do we navigate, right? How do we navigate when we have different types of personalities, confidence levels, this idea of networking? And we're often told to get out of our comfort zones, right? But I think a lot of people of color, a lot of people in marginalized communities get out of their comfort zones. They have to get out of their comfort zones. So can you tell us a little bit about how to navigate it, you know, navigate the small talk, when they don't want to include you, how to how to balance that across, as I said, different personalities. And of course, I'm sure someone out there eventually is going to ask us, you know, how do you network in COVID-19? But we can come back to that during the Q&A. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and you're right. I mean, we we have no choice uh, but to get out of our, our shells at times, right? Because otherwise, um, you know, our careers could be stalled, not due to anything that we haven't done, just because of the way that the office politics are um, situated. But what I will say, I am, a lot of people may not know this, but I am an introvert too. Um, I, I, I hold the badge <laughs> and, and I, I have to push myself. Um, but what I, what I found out is I don't have to be like, we all know that person on our team who is like extreme extrovert, right? We don't have to necessarily be like them. We have to find our version of authenticity to be social <laughs> and and, and for me, it wasn't talking to every person in the break room. It wasn't um, getting on the virtual bingo and, you know, being the life of the party. It, it is, who are those couple of people that, or even one person that I can talk to, right? Or that I can slide into their private message and say, oh, that was funny or whatever. You know, like <laughs> you, you just, it has to be authentic to you or you're not going to enjoy it. It's going to seem like a task. But again, if you're wanting to build social capital, which it's, it's imperative in the workplace because again, people are making decisions and you want them to consider you. You want them to be thinking about you. You want them to know what type of work you're doing and what your career goals are so that when an opportunity arises, they think, oh yeah, Minda, you know, or oh yeah, <laughs> Dr. Coleman. But they don't know those things if they don't know you. Typically, it's really hard for that to happen. But um, figure out what it looks like for you. I, I often say it's small acts of courage, right? So if you go to something, you don't have to stay the entire time, but maybe this time you'll stay 15 minutes, right? This time you might put something in the chat. <laughs> you know, this time you might push yourself to ask a question. Um, and those are the types of things that I even push myself today. I mean, I still have a lot of social anxiety, uh, but it's one of those things that I say, okay, well, what feels good to you, Minda? And then we stay within, I set boundaries, right? Or even if I'm, when I was um, traveling, I would travel a lot during the week and some of the social anxiety of even, you know, signing books and doing those sorts of things. Like I would even say, you know, I wanna do those things, I wanna meet people, but can we do it under these kind of guidelines? Because I can show up my best self if these parameters 
right here. Right? And, uh, and, and I don't be afraid, you know, self-advocacy is a form of self-love. And again, that's understanding what your boundaries are and knowing that, okay, I'm going to talk to one person at this event, or maybe I don't talk to anybody, but I showed up, you know, that's a win. <laughs> so figure out what it looks like uh, for you. But I, I definitely don't want you to discount relationship building. And it's not just making relationships just for the sake, it's strategically making relationships with people um, that you can help and then reciprocity that they can help you as well. And it's about that follow-up, right? Because that's what oh. you did, you followed up. So, so that's really key. And I appreciate you sharing with us about your own introversion. And I think that's right, right? Figuring out who you are mm -hmm. and what, what those steps are, step-by-step, step, putting one foot in front of the other. And sometimes it's 10 minutes, then it's seven, then it's nine. And then maybe it's, you know, a, a, a thumbs up in the chat and then maybe a question the next time, right? So yeah. it's little by little making those moves in terms of making yourself. And the other thing that underscores what I think you're saying is you have to know what your, what I call your triggers are, right? Those things that make it difficult for you to be in the room, right? Whether it's social anxiety or whatever it is. Um, and so thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing of yourself. Thank, well, thank you. And, you know, eventually I just have to put this out there. For, for all the introverts. Eventually I even had a karaoke song. So I was able to do, <laughs> it, took, it took those small acts of courage, but you know, you have one in your back pocket. <laughs> Let me encourage people, please start putting the questions in if you have some, uh, we have, I, I have, I have, I can keep asking questions as well. Okay, now the, uh, I'm piggybacking on some of the things you just said, because one of the other things you emphasize is a career toolkit and you return to this in your final chapter. As we evaluate what is in our toolkits, obviously we talked just a little bit about authenticity, et cetera. How can we reconcile the reality sometimes of limited resources and opportunities? And so, <coughs> excuse me, I'm catching it. Um, can, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about how we refine our skills? Because some of us, right, we're in real challenges in terms of funding and financial support. So what are some avenues that we might pursue or approaches or recommendations that you might have um, when you know, you're know you in a company and your boss is saying, no, I'm not gonna give you that professional development opportunity, but you know you need that professional development opportunity. Yep, well, I think that's a great question. And I think that we all have to figure out, we have to assess our tool, just like most, most of us have a toolbox at home, right? And, and we, we need a career tool, toolbox, toolkit to make sure that we have the, the sharpest tools in our kit. We have the most up-to-date tools, because if you do get that call from Chuck or whomever, you got to be ready, right? You got you to have them tools ready to go. And so I, I want you to consider what your career goals are, first and foremost, and what tools you're going to need to execute that. So if Currently, you're thinking about, oh, I want to be a people manager. What are the type of courses or classes that you would need? Um, maybe an emotional intelligence course would be helpful for you. Maybe reading a conflict resolution book would be helpful for you. And so thinking through what you might need um, in your toolkit, and that can be books, right? The library, don't forget, that's a, a resource <laughs> that's available to you. Um, sometimes we think we need, you know, the $2,000. Sometimes we do need the $2,000, but sometimes we can start small, which is use your library card, get, get those books, those resources to sharpen your tools. The other thing, um, inter the internet, social media, there's so many free courses um, online, um, even through NYU, take a look at the, the events that are happening, listen to speakers, start podcasts. There's so many ways that we can elevate and level up. Um, and then don't be afraid to invest in yourself when you have the opportunity. For me, one of the things early in my career, because I was shy um, and introverted, I didn't know how to use, again, I thought I didn't have a voice, but I did have one. I just needed to figure out how I wanted to use it. And But I noticed that everybody in the room uh, in a leadership position we're doing some form of public speaking. And I realized that I'm not going to be effective in the room if I'm afraid to speak. And so I started to invest in myself in public spe speaking courses way back then, um, over 10 plus years ago, because I knew at some point I'd need them. And so I took invested in improv classes, which I hated every minute of it, but it was the best thing that I could have ever done for myself. And then eventually, um, I just kept taking courses. And so don't be afraid to bet on you, invest in yourself, because if you want other people to invest in you, you gotta be willing to do that work too. But you're doing that already, obviously. 
I muted myself because I was <laughs> drinking. Uh, I, I cannot underscore that enough. Thank you. Because I think the investment in, in, in self and then really thinking about how you are navigating the next steps <clears throat> and this career toolkit. And I like how you said, right, we have toolkits in our houses and we have to evaluate those. If you don't have a screwdriver, you don't have a Phillips, a flathead, you got to go out and figure out, right? And again, libraries, internet. And the other thing that you brought up earlier was right, talking to people, doing those kinds of informational sessions long before they someone's your sponsor, right? So, uh, so again, thank you. Now, um, you, uh, you have a lot of um, references to uh, women of color, as I mentioned before, and you actually said the say, 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 say my name, say my name. And again, a shout out to Kimberly Crenshaw and her, uh, and her work, right, about saying the names of women of color who have been <coughs> the victims of violence, et cetera, and um, have not been counted. Um, and this brings us to this idea of representation. And you talk a lot about how representation matters. And you provide some statistics that I would just like to read. Uh, women of color like, make up less than 5% in uh, Facebook. W, uh, women of color are, are hold less than 11% of management roles and 8% of senior management roles. And as we all know, uh, less than 4% of executive roles in the US. Uh, right now there are, uh, well, we, this has changed recently, but right now uh, CEOs, so minimal, <laughs> very minimal uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And we know about Ursula Burns, uh, Xerox and some others, but that it's usually, and this goes back to what you said, there's one or two, they leave, and then they're, then we have to wait another, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years. Um, and, uh, and, and you also talk about the labor force, right? The availability pool. And then it was, we already talked about the education of this particular uh, group, uh, black women, and then in general, women of color, depending on uh, particularly which category we're talking about. But you provide a list of women of colors who've taken their place among the hierarchy, but you describe yourself. And this is where I really, right? You talk about this and then you talk about as an address to these issues and you build on the work of Melody Hobson, one of my favorite people as well. And you talk about uh, a corporate Kaepernick. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about what it means to be a corporate Kaepernick. <laughs> yes. Um, it, well, you alluded to it earlier in our conversation, which is courage. And the, the definition of courage is the ability to do something that frightens one. And I knew in the workplace that if I didn't use my voice for women who looked like me and future generations, then um, I would just be passing on the generational trauma, right? Not, and, and I didn't want that for the next generation. And I also didn't want to perpetuate systems of white supremacy inside the workplace. And so I knew that I needed to talk about that, but I told you, I was hoping that somebody else would have written. <laughs> I was hoping that that, that was, was the introversion part. <laughs> you were waiting for someone else to take up yes, the side. I, I was waiting. I was waiting a long time for that. And um, but what I realized again that moment with Trayvon Martin that really hit me. And I thought, what, what am I going to do to be part of creating change? And behind me, you could see um, Shirley Chisholm, and I on on another side of me is Harriet Tubman. Uh, but you can't see it in the in the in the shot. But I am a direct beneficiary of their courage. And some of the things that they did, the steps that they took, the way that they used their voice, they were never, some of, some, some of them um, were never able to experience some of that freedom, right? And, and so we have an opportunity to use our voices because so many other people benefit when we do. We are and the beneficiaries. We are beneficiaries of their courage. And I, I wanted to be able to leave an inheritance of courage, a, a, a workplace that um, women who look like me benefit from. And if that meant taking the proverbial knee, if that meant speaking truth to power inside the workplace and shining a light and showing that the workplace doesn't work for everybody, but you know what, there's a way that we could solve that. And if that meant um, putting myself out there a little bit, then it was all worth it. And I, I do it a hundred more times um, uh, again. I have to say, I think that's the movement from introversion, right? When you... <laughs> You get that burning desire, you got to do it. So that's right. Things out the bottle, right? <laughs> get it out. That's right. Um, so one of the reasons I work in higher ed is because I really 
want to work with um, you know students and emerging leaders and uh, um, I stay in higher ed. There are opportunities for me to you know go other places, but I, I I'm deeply committed to to the educational process. And I'm actually uh, one of the things that you describe in your book, which was uh, which. <clears throat> sort of made me think about this, is you describe your book as a love letter to women of color. And I think of my work as a love letter to those people who've been most marginalized, most excluded. And so, um, and I'm interested in the uplift, right? Because I'm interested in joy. I'm interested in how we move from deficit to asset. So what are three takeaways, gifts that you hope our rising stars, emerging leaders, women of color reading your book will receive from this love letter? Yes. Uh well, first of all, knowing that there are people like us who are <clears throat> who are working so that you inherit a better workplace than we did. And so knowing that, uh, as Audre Lorde said, uh, that you're good enough to deserve it. So I want you to read the memo knowing that someone was thinking about you. They were thinking about your experiences and hopefully that you wouldn't have to have some of the same experiences that I had because you have the tools, you have the, the iron to sharpen, you know what tools to pick up when you need them. Uh, number two, self-advocacy. Self-advocacy is a form of self-love. If you're not advocating for yourself, nobody else will. <laughs> not the way you can. Uh, and so don't be afraid to let people know what you're working on and how they can help you. Um, we don't have to. Also, I, I mentioned that um, being grateful isn't on the job description and, and being a strong Blank, blank isn't on the job description either, okay? You don't have to be strong, okay? <laughs> you can ask for help. Um, and there's ways that we can do that in community. And then lastly, um, your mindset. You know, it's the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. So tell yourself that you do belong in these spaces, that you are worthy of equity. And I, I think because we've been in environments where we feel othered, we sometimes forget that um, we... It's, it should be table stakes, dignity and respect. Um, and uh, I just want people to, to feel that love because yes, I talk about some painful moments in the memo, but knowing that to your point uh, there, we are an asset and we, and we are the prize. Thank you. I'll tell you this funny thing about gratitude. Once I worked for an organization and someone passively aggressively, a supervisor gave me a book, a present that said, it was a book on gratitude. And I wrote an email that said, I'm so glad that you're grateful I'm here. <laughs> Sometimes we have to turn those things. So I appreciate you reframing, right? This notion of gratitude and how gratitude can be operationalized, table stakes, mindset. So thank you very much for that. Now, again, we're about to turn to some questions from our audience. I, um, I have one more question I'm going to ask you. I mean, I have lots of questions, but... <laughs> Okay, I passed it on to you. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> Who knew we could do that through Zoom? <laughs> so my next question is really um, around, excuse me, I lost my place in my own, uh, my own notes. Uh, so the other thing that you talk a little bit about is how you moved through your, your journey to, to come to the understanding of self and amplifying your voice. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you were able to move to think about amplifying your voice? Where's, was it those sponsors? Was it the people? Was it the reading that you were doing? The, all the quotes that you, uh, uh, all the people, the Sojourner Truths, the Harriet Tubman's. Tell us about a little bit about how you created your own posse to help you move yourself through. Yeah, I, I think it was really going back into our, our archives, uh, the evidence, right? Uh, the evidence of our ancestors and our, those leaders who came before us. And I really just started to immerse myself in, <clears throat> in reading because they, they were the leadership books that I needed, right? <laughs> reading about their stories and how they took matters into their own hands. And they weren't, they realized that they had more power than they thought they did, right? To, to shift and change and dismantle systems. And if you help one person, you set someone free, right? If you help two, then they can set and you, and you create a chain reaction. And so for me, I really was just reading about um, our forefathers and mothers and, and looking at even my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother and just from the strength in which we come and understanding that I, do, I deserve and we all deserve 
an opportunity to thrive in the workplace and not just survive. And once I realized that I deserved that, right, because some of my colleagues are doing that, <laughs> you know, they're thriving. Could you repeat they that again? <laughs> Yeah, I did not want, I, I was barely surviving in the workplace and I wanted to thrive. And it's almost like a, a car ride, right? Two things can be true at the same time. We might be riding in the car together someplace, but we experienced that car ride very differently. And I wanted, um, if you've only ever, you know, I'm one of three kids. So when we used to go on trips, I'd sit in the middle seat. Now, when we get to our destination, my parents would be like happy and they'd be like, how are you guys doing? I'd be like, were we in the same car, right? <laughs> and so, you know, I've been fighting with my brothers. And I think when we think about equity and we think about diversity and inclusion and belonging, yes, we all might work at the same place, but we experience that place very differently. And my coworkers who always got to sit in the front seat, right, always got to ride shotgun, hadn't even considered what it was like for me to be in the middle, hadn't considered that I might be uncomfortable. And I realized that I'm, I can't wait for them to ask me, what, what do I need from them to do the best work of my career? I needed to let them know what I need from them to do the best work of my career. <laughs> so, and, and I just started to lean into that courage and push aside my caution because I just knew that I was worthy of that, right? And that also it's bigger than myself because if I create space, then I'm creating it for somebody else as well. And I just didn't want to wait on the workplace to work for me when I had already experienced it, seeing that it hadn't. And so um, it requires revolutionary acts sometimes. And again, that, that self-advocacy for some is revolutionary and for some it's a privilege. You know? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for making that distinction because those small revolutionary acts, right? We know that there can be retribution as well, retaliation. So taking those steps, and I think underscoring courage again. So, all right, so I have a question from the audience. So <clears throat> what is the role of the economic structure? So if we, this is an, a question about thinking about economics and under, undermining equity, which uh, of course, at the same time provides certain opportunities, but then uh, there's a cutthroat competitive nature, right? So this question is also about that scarcity model that we talked about before. Uh, so as long as there is a divisive competitive structure, uh, would you say that inequity would be would be there? In other words, is part of the part of the corporate structure endemic, meaning that you have those kinds of co competitions? And so, was it endemic that you'll have these disparities that will always exist? Well, uh, you know, that's a, a big question and I hope, I hope not, but it's really gonna require all hands on deck, right? We have to, the system was created for only a couple people, mostly for white men to thrive, right? It wasn't even considered white women. It took a while for even them, but I, I think that we have to be, um, we have to realize that it's gonna take all hands on deck to dismantle a system and build one that's more equitable. But the only way we're going to do that is if we, speak truth to power, or if we decide that we don't wanna work at places that are not upholding um, systems of diversity, equity, inclusion. And I think also too, we have to decide on how we want to spend our time and where we want to do the work, right? And we have to hold our leadership accountable and our colleagues accountable. And um, not only that, it can't be people of color always holding everyone accountable. That's where we need our allies. That's where we need our success partners that if we see any inequality, that it's the norm to speak up on it, not just when crisis happens. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if we continue to um, talk about these things, but I think at the crux of it, we really should talk about the pay gap because if we start some pay transparency and have those conversations, then that's one way that um, when you think about what part of the equation can we solve is let's talk about pay transparency, right? Let's talk the numbers that Dr. Coleman mentioned um, at the top of the hour, um, we could solve some of those problems, right? We don't need 50 years to, to bring it to parity. We could, those are things that can be solved fairly quickly. And if we saw anything in 2020, um, I consult with some companies and they used to tell me when I suggest something, they'd say, oh, we can't do that for another five to seven years. And in 2020, they were able to do um, half of those things in like two days. <laughs> so, so, we, so we really could, <laughs> it's the intentionality for me, right? If we're intentional about dismantling systems, if we say that we want the workplace to work for everybody, then it's gonna require 
um, some revolutionary acts, right? And, and I, I know that it's possible because I've seen the needle move pretty quickly in 2020. So I think if we keep the foot on the gas, then um, we can definitely bring um, some of those structures to, to parity. Absolutely. Thank you. And I absolutely, I mean, I think you're right, right? If we think about the pay gap, if we think about some of the things that we can prioritize and close uh, quickly, and I think you're absolutely right. Also, competitiveness doesn't necessarily mean discrimination, right? Those two things don't. So it doesn't mean we can have competitiveness and not always have the same people on the bottom of the sort of organization, which is a, you know what you point out in terms of thinking about those parity issues, right? Um, so the, your answer actually leads me right into the next question from our audience, and it's about this pay gap. Given that, and this question is about Black women in particular are, are underpaid, underpaid as compared to right, white, their, their peers, particularly their white peers, how do you assure when you're going into a role that you uh, are getting what you deserve in terms of payment? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think that, again part of the equation that we can solve is what we do, and so I would encourage you to do as much of your due diligence and have those informational interviews with people. Um, we there's a lot of um, sites online, PayScale, um, Salary.com. You know, find out what the the standard rate or the the going rate is for the role in which you which you're looking for, and then also every state has an equal pay law. Make sure that you take a look at those, um, but also talk to people. You know, I don't think I know sometimes in at least in the black black families we're like don't tell anybody your business, but if you want to know what you're supposed to be making, we have to ask certain questions, right? And so um, ask, you know, at least a range uh, because I think it's really important for us to have as much information as possible because you might go into a situation and ask for $100,000, but if the range is 100 to 150 and you just walk away and take what they gave you, again, being grateful, then had you asked the right questions, had you done the research, you would have known that there was a range for a reason. And so don't discredit having all of your information. And, and even if you need, and here's where I'll say about investing in yourself, if you're not good at asking those type of questions or you're not good at salary negotiation, hire a negotiation coach. You know, uh, and um, the, there's so many tools that we that we can leverage to make sure that we're ready. And you and success is not a solo sport. Like I think about the success that I've had in my career, and it's not because of myself. It's because I had a squad. I've had a, people invested in my success, and so don't be afraid to also bring people to your squad to help you prepare for those and role play too. Because when we're talking about money, sometimes that's high stakes, right? So make sure that you have different scenarios and you feel comfortable answering and asking those questions. But most companies and most organizations expect someone will ask those questions and they're happy when you don't. So push it. <laughs> push right, that's right. And I love this coach. You know, I said this one year, it was early in my career. I was at a, a, a function where they, this man was talking about negotiation. I wrote down his name. I did not call him for 11 years. When I called him, he was like, I don't even do that anymore. I was like, well, <laughs> But I knew he was good, right? So he referred me, et cetera. So to your point, right? Think the long tail and preparation. And now you've emphasized preparation a number of times, but I think this is really key in terms of your squad and thinking about right asking the right questions because that helps you get prepared for then what you know what you're what you might need to do in terms of that negotiation and strategy. Yeah. Uh, the last thing that I'll say, Dr. Coleman, too, is sometimes we think in terms of only money, but also think about those fringe benefits. Um, maybe. Maybe it's professional development stipend that you need. Maybe it's work the conferences from home, you want to you know, attend. Conferences. So think about it. Um, the broad scope of things. Don't just child think care. Just all of that. <laughs> <laughs> all of it, exactly. And and I want to emphasize again, like you said. And if you don't know all of those things, get a coach. Get someone who teaches negotiation. You can probably tell I teach negotiation. So well, we could come. We could talk all day about that. Okay. Uh, let's talk about, um, so these, the next set of questions are, uh, sort of related and I'm going to sort of 
ask them. So some of this is about sort of the different, where you are along your career, right? If you're a younger person versus someone who's more seasoned, that's how I like to think of it, like myself, <laughs> um, right? And then sort of thinking about how you as a younger person begin to develop those networks. And as you're developing those networks, how do we begin to think about how, and this, the next question is really about how do we, you talked about opening pathways. And I think what happens, and I think this is true, that some people are afraid, right? Once they get into those positions that they're being looked at so hard, right? And taken so uh, often experiencing disparities in their roles. So how do we begin to think about how we form communities that help, right? Uh, let's say women of color, African-American women, Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, uh, indigenous, et cetera, women start to think about how we exist in those spaces and then open up uh, uh, spaces for others. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's important. I think that I, I've been thinking a lot about racial trauma in the workplace and I, I often think that it, with anything, not just trauma, or even when you're celebrating trauma, or you, you have trauma, but you're celebrating wins as well. It's nice to have community, right? And we heal in community, at least I, I, I believe that to be true. And so I think it's so important that we do have a group of people that we can lean on for support, because on those moments when you are the only one, or you're one of few, it's the, it's the thing that's gonna make you not maybe want to scream, you know, <laughs> um, after a hard situation, or you have some questions about salary or negotiation, then you have a group of people that you can tap into. So I think it's really important also when we're thinking about building our networks to tap into those resources, tap into those communities, because they, they may be the people that can speak your name in the room. Maybe you're at, you know, maybe you're working in a, a department or you're having some conflict right now. And maybe those ex external networks are the ones that will actually help you on your next path to, um, forward. And so always kind of be thinking about, it's not just, um, my grandmother always says, you know, don't put your, <laughs> don't put all your eggs in one basket. And that's why I started to think about my squad in the workplace. It wasn't just building community with my colleagues, but what about those people in other departments? And then I started to join um, service organizations because I didn't have the, the privilege of working with other women of color in that way, but I was able to tap into other resources and communities so that I felt supported. So if you don't feel supported in the ways that you need to, don't discount that you say, and it's the stories that we tell ourselves, I'm not supported. Maybe I'm not supported here, but it doesn't mean I can't gain support from somewhere else. So definitely continue to show up for these conversations, join communities because they're, they're out there. And sometimes um, we get in our way uh, and, and don't tap into those external resources and communities that could really be helpful. I can't, you couldn't have said it better. And I think the networks and really thinking about those networks and, 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 and as you said, right, you might not find support where you are right now. So you might have to go outside. You might have to reach out to you, Mindy. <laughs> Might have to, yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> I'm saying, right? I mean, seriously, read your book, do those yeah. things that help you, right? And I think the other thing that you've also underscored is sustaining relationships, right? Not just yes. those one off relationships, which is when you talked about going out and making those other networks, et cetera, because sustaining those networks throughout time, that's how your, your name will get mentioned in those rooms five or six years later after you have it. And I say this all the time, I applied for a job once, someone called someone I hadn't worked for in eight years. There's no way I would have put them on my resume, right? And he was someone who, who was, you know, who, who helped me and propelled my career to talk about what you're saying, right? And it was eight years in the past. I would have never thought about it. So sustaining, being conscientious and developing those, those networks and the, and the squad, as you, you say, I call it a, a little bit of a posse. Okay. <laughs> so I think I have uh, time for Maybe, let me see if I have time for one more question. Okay, so I'm gonna have one more question, which, um, and then uh, maybe you can answer this one quickly and then I'm gonna close with a question. So okay. can you tell us a little bit about some examples that you've seen of effective allyship, right? Upstander, bystander allyship. Any examples that you might share with our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So one example that, um, I'll share is, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, Dr. Coleman, but I, I think it, it might work. So 
I was at an event and I'll put myself in the hot seat. So I was in an event and um, this was prior to COVID-19 and it was a small intimate reception for thought leaders. And it, it was a room that I, I didn't know. I knew other people, but just by name, but I hadn't met them. Long story short, we were having, you know, drinks, appetizers waiting for the the dinner to to begin and I was having (laughs) yeah I know I miss miss those days um and I'm I'm sitting there or I'm standing there having conversation with two other people that I didn't know but doing my small talk right and so I'm I'm having the conversation and one of the um there was a a black man and then there was a, a trans woman and we were having this conversation and she was talking and um the, the black man kept referring to her as he. And I was kind of drifting out and then it hit me like, Minda, this is your opportunity to shift allyship into action. <laughs> and so I, I said, she said, blah, 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 blah. I reinforced how she wanted to be identified and I didn't have to create a scene. I just reinforced, I said, she said, blah, blah, blah. And when I had said that, he then started saying she. Right, we didn't have to have. A, it was just. You didn't have to have that whole dialogue. No, but but I, I say that not to pat myself on the back, but I, it was almost a missed opportunity because again, sometimes we think it's this grand act, right? But it was a grand act because it was. And after it happened, she looked at me and she smiled. She felt seen, right? And I'm glad that I noticed that. And then he was able to. We created the norm right? We get to create the norm. <laughs> and then he switched gears. You know, we didn't, uh, we didn't adhere to his status quo. We switched to um, what needed to happen. And so I want people to think about that, how you're, how you're being aware of when you can show up for people, because showing up is when it counts. And each of us, maybe you were in brownies or Girl Scouts or 4-H or something like that. In order to get the badge, you had to do the thing, right? <laughs> so if, so if you <laughs> Okay. So if you want to be an ally, it's great intentions, but you have to shift it into allyship because that's the, or action, because that's the only way we're going to dismantle these systems. And when the people around us notice, they, we normalize what good looks like. So let's normalize what good looks like. I can't exactly. Intention does not equal outcome and impact. And what a great, what a great story in terms of redirection. So thank you. And I think it's so important how you emphasize it's, it was a grand act and very well, right, strategically placed, mm-hmm. right? All right, so you draw music and soundscapes throughout your book. This is the last question. And you, uh, you do seem to really love music because there's so many references in there, among other things. Um, in my work in office, we emphasize, as I said before, joy, we're at, we, we play music, we do all kinds of things. So what brings you joy? What is keeping you motivated in terms of your journey? And what continues to bolster and sustain you and your commitment to this work? Yeah, Uh, really just having these sorts of conversations because it wasn't too long ago that these conversations weren't welcomed in the workplace, right? We were having them amongst ourselves and we couldn't talk about what it's like to bring the pieces of ourselves to the workplace. So that's what sustains me because um, I'm just glad that I can be alive to have these important conversations. And it, the more we have them, then it inspires others to figure out what good looks like. And we create a better system that works for everybody. And so um, I, I'm proud to be a part of that. And thank you for, for inviting me. Thank you for being part of this conversation. Thank you for, again, sharing all that you have. You have. Thank you for highlighting these important intersections, right, and the differences when we think about gender and the applications of power and what happens in terms of disparity, and then how we can come together, what real success partners might look like, and how we might actually build coalitions. I think that you've just given us some tremendous information and also some tremendous strategies. Let me say to everyone out there again Did I say get the book? Here it is. (laughs) Get the book. Get the book. Minda, I cannot thank you enough. It is a pleasure to have been in conversation with you. Uh, We look forward. And as I said, of course, Minda is one of our professors. So we have the great fortune of having her at Wagner and around at NYU. But those of you who are joining us outside of NYU, we plan on keeping her. So um, please, uh, please visit MindaHart.com, her website, so that you can get additional information and uh, additional information about her uh, work and of course any other 
<clears throat> um, excuse me, lectures, et cetera, that she'll be doing. Again, we hope you will visit the OGI website to keep up with the events that we have it coming up. We have a lot of events coming up in the next month and of course, uh, throughout the rest of the semester. And we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Please remember to take very good care of yourselves, your colleagues, your peers, and everyone. And uh, again, wherever you are in the world, be safe, be well, and we'll see you again at our next one of our next events. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who made this possible, especially Minda Hartz. Bye for now, everyone, and have a terrific rest of the night.